When the Spanish arrived in the Americas, they treated indigenous people much like they did Muslims and other non-Christians. They massacred them. The Spanish set trained war dogs on people so often, they nicknamed natives dog food. The newly arrived Christians of the 15th and 16th century ripped open limbs and maximized the effects of 200 pound mastiffs, partly in the hopes to spread their belief system of Christian love, redemption, and salvation. They used the veil of Christianity to justify the dawn of the greatest genocide in world history. In Coloa, Mexico, after killing tens of thousands of people in warfare, which included starving women and children to death, Hernán Cortés ordered Cuauhtémoc, the last Mexica ruler, tortured in pursuit of what the Spaniard really wanted, gold and glory. A short time later, Cuauhtémoc was killed by Cortés's order. But what's most important to this lecture is the manner in which the church attempted to destroy Mesoamerican religion. The church destroyed countless religious books called codices and destroyed temples, schools, libraries, food, and countless cultural works and artifacts, trying to eradicate all of Mesoamerican history. In July of 1562, the Spanish friar Diego de Landa burned countless Mayan codices in the attempt to spread the gospel of Christ. That policy was repeated throughout the Americas where nearly 100 Americans lived. Only 5% would remain 100 years later. And to this day, only 12 pre-Columbian books survive the Spanish atrocities. Now, as the church attempted to eradicate Mesoamerican religions, the killing of natives by Spaniards was legally justified, meaning it was okay to kill. Killing native Mexicans was legally okay to the Spaniards because the opportunity to save souls was legally paramount to the mass killings. Spain provided this legal justification for the brutal conquest of Mexico. Uh, Catholicism became compulsory as the official new religion of Mexico New Spain. The church grew rich and were the largest landowners in all of Mexico. The church nearly controlled everything and they built some of the most extravagant buildings in all of the Americas where people were killed and starved. And then the Inquisition came in 1569 and the process was rejuvenated. Now this lecture is about the transformation of Mexican religion from Polydeus Mesoamerican through their Christianization in New Spain. Now its primary focus is how Mesoamerican religion evolved through or survived through colonial Mexico and transformed into, and here's the answer, transformed into a new syncretic mestizaje hybrid religion that kept some ancient elements and incorporated new Christian elements into their belief system. Moreover, this lecture examines Mesoamerican religious arts that survived and persisted in the colonial era, at least for a while. The spiritual conquest was not complete. The past remains. Mexican colonial religion was syncretic, and this syncretism in itself can even be seen as a form of indigenous resistance as a way to decolonize. And our first example is the Aztec featherwork known as Amantecas, not Mantecas, which is my high school nickname, but Amantecas, which is a Nahuatl word. Ancient Mexicans were masters of creating intricate featherworks, many for religious purposes, because feathers were seen as sacred and probably more valuable than anything they have, including gold or silver. In the Florentine Codex, which is a post-conquest uh, codex, it shows the Mexica mastery of creating important feather artwork. And feather artwork traditions continued in the colonial era. 
Now, by far, the most famous example is the Mass of St. Gregory. This was created in 1539 and is one of the oldest featherworks with a Christian subject in all of the Americas. It was created by surviving Mexicas as the world was turned upside down by the Spanish. It is made nearly entirely from feathers. And it is placed on a wood frame. The amazing artwork represents an apparition of Jesus Christ at a European Mass in the 6th century. And the narrative goes that when Pope Gregory was giving Mass, some onlookers scoffed at the idea of the Holy Eucharist, which states, this is the body of Christ, this is the blood of Christ. It was at that moment that the Christ appeared with stigmata and in full humility. This important artwork has been created many, many times over a thousand years including colonial Mexico. It was made by Mexicans under the supervision of Franciscan uh, friars. The artwork was especially commissioned by Diego Juancin, nephew and son-in-law of Moctezuma II for Pope Paul III. The art is ba also based on a Flemish engraving from circa 1500. And although there's clearly Christian subject, this Amanteca featherwork is really syncretic incorporating Aztec subjects and techniques into a Christian theme. Now, the very fact that it's done in feathers has obvious Aztec religious overtones. Using sacred feathers are indicative of Aztec worship and praise for their own deities. Blue feathers are often from the hummingbirds, which is the representation of their patron deity, Wichliapochli, which translates into hummingbird left, and the Quetzal, Cotingo and macaw feathers used here in this artwork are also holy in the Mexica dogma. Second, look at those uh, the priest robes. They have very subtle, or really not so subtle, Mesoamerican iconography and imagery. There are also symbols of America, such as the corn and pineapples and herbs that you can find in, in the artwork. Now, all of this is a fancy way of saying that, that there is double meaning. Of course, they can have two meanings. It can have the Christian element and then the Mexica element as well, which is another way of saying this is secretism, perhaps at its finest. Now, here's another example of Mexican colonial featherwork, the Weeping Virgin from 1590. Feather on mosaic on copper, and on the right is the engraved version. Here's another great colonial featherwork example, Saint Michael slaying the, the devil, late 16th century. And these Mexican Amantecas were so popular, they were exported throughout the world, including Japan, where new research suggests they influenced samurai outfits who began to sew feather work gowns on top of these fantastic samurai uh, outfits that you are probably familiar with. Here's another great featherwork example. This time, it's on a bishop's a mitre uh, made from feathers. And this one has obvious religious overtones because it's a bishop's mitre. So, obviously, another syncretic uh, message there. The next example of colonial syncretic religion is religious art made from corn. Obvious double meaning overtones. Now, this artwork that you're looking at is made from corn. This is a Christ made from a corn paste. An armature of corn stock and paper was covered with a plaster made from corn, orchards, maguey, a natural glue, and then completely gasoled and painted over into the miraculous piece that you see uh, today. Dozens of these corn stock paste figures of Jesus and other saints were made by the Aztecs and then exported to Spain and used in their religious Christian uh, processions. Now, if you take a second to uh, examine the importance of corn, corn is absolutely sacred. Corn is invented in Mexico. It was 70% of the Mexica diet. It was absolutely sacred for thousands of years in Mexico. Ancient Mesoamericans crafted many of the religious figurines using corn as a medium. The Aztecs also made idols out of a grain called amaranth, but that was banned by the Spaniards. Ooh, a grain. That was banned. So feathers and corn were still available, so they used them. 
And here's another great example. Baptismal. Baptismals. Here what you see is a small vase that appears to be a Christian baptismal, but it's not. In fact, it's a pre-Columbian art piece. Notice the feathered serpent legs. Reminiscent of the feathered serpent himself, Quetzalcoatl. In fact, the uh, Tlaxcatecas had a religious ritual where newborn babies were bathed in water, very, very similar to a Christian baptism. Uh, this is the spring of Tlaxcala or the um, Anchalicuat, which you know, jade or precious water. And remember, it's these vessels that you're looking at right here were used in Mesoamerican rites, were now being used in Christian baptism. Partly because early missionaries had no ritual objects to baptize converts. So they used Aztec arts and Tlaxcalan arts, i.e. Nezahualcoyotl's art in a Texcoco chapel. Let me give you one more example of this. Go ahead and take a look at this. This small rectangle is used for holy water today. It used to be a vessel for blood and human hearts by the Aztecs. But it is still in the church of Calastihualca today. And let me say that one more time. Today, Aztec vessels used in Aztec religious ceremonies are embedded in the wall of several Christian churches in Huatapec, Mexico, and used for holy water. They are still used to this day. Now, probably the most famous Ancoxicali or blood vessel is this Jaguar vessel. Here is the original color, and you can clearly see the vessels, the deep bowl where the blood offerings were kept in the middle towards the back. And let me say this again. Yes, blood vessels like these, not this one, or li like these were likely used during multiple Christian baptismals. The next great example is books. Mesoamericans wrote countless intricate and elaborate codices, these beautiful things that you see before you. Here you see the Codex um, um, Borgia and the Codex uh, Notal. Mexicans continued to write these religious books in the colonial era, but this time with Christian subject matters, teaching Christian catechism. These types of books were called Testarian writings, and they were named after Friar uh, Jacobo de Testera, one of the earliest missionaries to New Spain. Now, similar to Mesoamerican codices, these books were completely filled with Christian teachings, like the Ten Commandments or the Sacraments, but they were taught in a codex style and pictograms, like many Mesoamericans used. And here are a few examples. Although they're crude and not as beautiful as Mesoamerican works, you can clearly see the images of the Eucharist, the dove as the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary. And there she is on the left side. Alleluia. And here's a few more Testarian books. Again, colonial Christian books written in a Mesoamerican codex style to teach Christianity. Now, in this next example, it's very specific to one deity. In this case, the church actually used the knowledge of this Mesoamerican deity, uh, Tlaloc. Uh, Tlaloc was the immensely important divine being of water and fertility and had a shrine on top of the most important buildings in the Aztec world, the Templo Mayor or Huetiocali. Now, hoping to coax Native Americans into Christianity, Spanish friars again used San Isidio and Labrador as a transition from Tlaloc. So in this case, the, the church didn't really try to hide this Mesoamerican de uh, deity. Instead, they used them. They used Tlaloc as a way to transi transition from what they knew into what they were trying to teach them. The, the church also used other Mesoamerican deities as a stepping stone to Christianity. The next example looks at uh, Santa Maria Donatzinla Church in Puebla. Now, first of all, the fact that the name of the church is the name of a Mexica deity, Donatzin, is incredibly syncretic. But perhaps even more important is the artwork inside the church. 
that portrays this uh, a, a Mesoamerican afterlife represented as a paradise of the god Anthralak. So what you're looking at right now are modeled plaster work iconography. These are brown angels or tanned angels. They've been getting their sunlight. Child, Mexican children with plumes, Mexican fruits, acapolines, uh, tejacotes, nanches, guava, squash, cacao, chilies, corn, and other Mexican foods. Which is to say, it is very Mexican and not so much Christian inside of a Christian church. Although it looks very Christian, it really kind of isn't. Now, if you take a closer look at this, what you're looking at is a Mesoamerican paradise in the heaven of Tlaloc. If you look at the people in this colonial artwork, the people you see are not angels. They are native Mexican Indians who died by lightning, drowning, or some sort of aquatic setting which is ruled by by uh, Tlaloc. And this is another syncretic word with double meaning, obviously double meaning. And you can get a sense of Tlaloc there in the front with his famous goggles. Next examples. In these examples, you can clearly see Aztec stone artwork still on the streets of modern day Mexico City. When you're done with this lecture, you can go to Mexico City and check these out right now. The first one is a fantastic Az Aztec snake which is a sacred item and representative of their belief system. Now, more than likely, this snake was featured prominently in the Mexica sacred precinct. It's only a few blocks south of that, and it's actually in the exact spot where Cortez and Moctezuma II uh, first met. Now, this last image is of the preeminent scholar uh, David Carrasco with the image of Tlaloc, found on the streets of Mexico City today. And there are many more ancient artwork found throughout Mexican streets. Go ahead and take a look. Mesoamerican artworks were also used in the new Spanish buildings. And in this case, the artwork of Tlaculli was also used as a building foundation or building column, a cornerstone. Because Tlaculli was an earth deity, the artwork could be displayed right on the ground and sometimes face down. So it was appropriate which is why Aztec Tlalaculi art was actually used in Spanish buildings. You can see the column or the base of the structure on the screen here. In another Mesoamerican religious crossover, what we now know as the cross today, especially in Christianity, was also sacred in Mesoamerica as the four directions or the four cardinal points, east, west, north, south. The four points expanded across the universe and the axis mundi or the center of the universe was the steps of the Templo Mayor itself. Of course, and what a coincidence, Christianity also had their own cross. And it was another way to mass Mesoamerican religion into the colonial era. So again, cross meaning Christ and cross meaning pre-Columbian. This cross here is decorated in the native style, obviously, and again, and could and probably did have double meaning. Now, there are two more examples. We're almost done here. There are two more examples that we'll cover uh, quickly that shows the pre-Columbian religious rites and deities survived colonial Mexico. Now, the first one is Day of the Dead, what you know as Dia de los Muertos. This was a real... Mesoamerican festival that remember those who have transitioned over. Maybe you know someone who has transitioned over. But the festivals varied from region to region in parts of Mexico, and they lasted much longer, weeks and probably months. In fact, specific months were dedicated with how the person died, like a drowning, childbirth, or war. Now, what's changed during the colonial period? Well, what used to be weeks or months is now only one day, November 1st or, or November 2nd, which is All Souls Day. And that's no accident. That was on the assistance of priests who recognized Mexicans wouldn't stop celebrating the dead with their same religious rites and they wanted to curtail it. 
Their syncretic solution was to keep it all on one day. Now what else changed? The foods. Because amaranth was often made into holy statues, amaranth was banned. Ooh, they were banning carbs 500 years ago. And the birth of sugar skulls and other alternatives were born. It was also it also replaced real skulls that the Mashika sometimes put on altars. In fact, amaranth was used to make idols and then was eaten as a form of communion, very much like a, a Christian communion. Marigolds were used in Mesoamerica. They are still the preferred flower today. Altars were used in Mesoamerica. Altars are still used today. And copal and different types of incense are, were still used today, just like they were during Mesoamerica. Now, even the bread has a connection to Mesoamerica. The pan de muerto, right? This modern bread represents human bones. The circular shape represents the cycle of life and death which was absolutely sacred in the pre-Columbian era. Rebirth is key to Mesoamerican religion. The center represents the skull of the deceased, and the quills can, can have direct connection to patron deities, Quetzalcoatl, Atalak, and Xipetotec. Moreover, tens of thousands, probably even way more, of Aztec and Mesoamerican idols survived. They survived because they were hidden and saved by Mexicans trying to salvage their religion. Diego, Diego Rivera alone had 60,000 idols in his private collection. Bernal Diaz, who was there during the conquest, wrote, Many caciques refused to give up their religion. One native chief replied that it did not seem to them good to, to give up their idols and sacrifices, and that these gods of theirs gave them everything of which they had. And Robert Rickard, in 1963, in the Spiritual Congress of Mexico, writes, The survival of paganism in Mexico seems to be undeniable. The country, at least re certain regions of it, was full of hidden idols and secret idolaters. If anything, during the first part of the colonial period, uh, Jesus Christ was accepted, but he was only added to the pantheon. I mean, he didn't replace what they believed. He was only added to their polytheist beliefs. Okay, the last example here. Whew. The last example, maybe the greatest example of syncretic colonial religion is the patron saint of Mexico. La Morenita, La Reina, La Virgen de Guadalupe. And because we want to keep this short, I'm going to spare you the lecture. But after visiting four times with the neophyte Juan Diego... Archbishop Zumarga asked for proof of her apparition. So Jesus' mom told him to gather the Castilian roses in the month of December to show the priest as the proof. And the proof was engraved in the tilma. And although this is a story of Jesus' mom in Mexico, we have to ask the question, is she also part Mashika? And you can argue that the colors on the image are Mashika. The colors on her dress are Mashika, representing women and fertility, that she is brown skin, that she speaks Nahuatl, that she is found in Montepiac, a sacred ground for an Aztec female deity or deities. That the December 12th date is the start of a new Mashika calendar. And in fact, the name Guadalupe more than likely, it's probably a mispronunciation of a Mesoamerican na name. We know the Spaniards had a lot of trouble um, saying Nahuatl's words. And here is Don Ancin in a similar stance as La Virgen, who's on the left. And with that, we're going to wrap up and say thank you for joining us. This uh, lecture is dedicated to everybody who has half someone who has transitioned or has moved over. I wish you and your family the best. Thank you. Have a great day.